Father Lawrence, would you like to say just a, a couple words about uh, your your experience or what it means for you to come back to, to New Harmony uh, and, and to do that before you go in to lead us in our first meditation and introduce, introduce us to, to meditation? I'm uh, glad, glad for you to come up to the microphone and and do that if, if you see fit. Well, it means a lot. As I was, um, as I was, uh, I don't have a, 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 my memory. It doesn't go in years. It goes in places, faces, <laughs> but years get. Uh, I can never pinpoint a year. But as I, as I drove here today, uh, I recognised the uh, the roads that led here, and uh, it all came back. The place. The spirit of place is very powerful. I think this place is very powerful in a strange way. New Harmony was founded in the 19th century as a utopian community by Richard Owen, an English utopian. And like most utopian ventures, it didn't last very long. So he went home, but his sons apparently stayed here and continued to, to build the town. And uh, it... Uh, continued until I think in the middle of the 19th century it became the center for the geographical survey of the US. So in some ways it's the center of the US. And uh, then it receded back into, into um, in, you know, quietness. And uh, then Jane Blaffer Owen who was um, from Houston and uh, the heiress of, I think, of two oil fortunes, married, uh, as it was a long time ago, I think I can reveal this. She said as a, as a young woman, she'd always wanted to be a nun and uh, came from a Presbyterian and Episcopalian family, but that wasn't going to happen. Uh, but she married, um, well, I don't know if I should say all this, should I? Well, let's say, put it like this. She, she, she said that she, uh, she married, and um, the marriage continued uh, until her husband's death many years later. But when she, uh, her, he was a, a descendant of Richard Owen uh, and brought her here during his honeymoon, their honeymoon, to uh, just uh, see, show her the place, and she fell in love with New Harmony. And it was a very deep connection bond. Now I think about it, it's rather like the sense of connection I felt when we arrived for the very first time to see, to see Bonbeau, our center in France. It's just a kind of recognition. Or, so she must have had some kind of experience like that. And then for the rest of her life, she, she, she was based in Texas, but. She poured a great deal of her love and spirit and, and money into um, renovating and also updating, reno, uh, renovating um, New Harmony. And as you can see, as you walk around, modern architecture. And at the heart of it was her Christian faith. There's a, there's a roofless church here. So in some ways, it, and she sponsored the John Main Seminar in 1991 through our mutual friend, Milo Kerper, who was later a chair of the guiding board. So there's the connection. So all of those different fields of memory are activated. And, um, and Father Bede was a close friend and a supporter of me and the community after John Main died. They knew each other and were friends and recognized in each other I think common, uh, common values in different fields. Father Bede more in the interfaith and Father John more in the recovery of the, of the uh, Christian contemplative tradition uh, through meditation. And, um, but Bede had a, a deep admiration for Father John who died in 1982 at a young age of 56 and wrote to me at that time and said, 
he, he, he felt that John Lane was the most important uh, spiritual teacher in, in the church at that time. So the connection with Father Bede uh, was, was a fruit in a way of that loss. And uh, in the circumstances of the time, we came to do the John Lane seminar here. And I think the name of the place, New Harmony, is, is significant. And the choice of his title for the seminar, The New Creation in Christ, was also very significant. When I asked him what he would like to give the seminar on, he said, um, he said John Main's teaching on meditation and community. And he put that into, this, into the theology of the new creation. And it's one of, I think it's one of his most important books. So, uh, and then, as you heard from the, from the eyewitnesses, uh, uh, people came together. We had just gone through a traumatic uh, phase uh, in, in moving from Montreal uh, the year before to London. We sort of, as, as happens in these transitions, a lot of pain, but also a lot of birth. Birthing was happening, but we didn't quite know what was being born. And uh, I don't think we came here thinking that this would be the Pentecost that it was. But it was. It was an extraordinary gathering of faith-filled friends. Faith, F, F, F faith-filled friends, and probably like the disciples gathering in the upper room. And Bede's vision was, was so broad and so deep. And there was a, a, a bishop here, Bishop um, John, what's his name, from Ontario at the time, who was a, a friend of the communities. And he said to me, he was listening very carefully to everything Bede said. And he was a little cautious in case there was something heretical or <laughs> unorthodox in what he was saying. And he said there was, he said, he, and he was the chair, he was the chair of the, of the uh, Canadian Col uh, Conference of Bishops. So he was careful. But he was, uh, he was also deeply struck by the, orthodoxy, but also the, the vitality and the freshness of Bede's vision of, 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 a, of Christianity um, expanding out beyond its European uh, form uh, into something universal and, of course, cosmic. So I think the, 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 the vision, the teaching of Father Bede, he himself feeling very inspired by what was happening, that was a major memory of mine, this, just this feeling of something awakening, uh, a vision rooted deeply in the, the, the faith-filled friends, but also um, something going, as Peter said, Peter Ng said, a strong sense of a beginning, but not knowing where it was going. And um, so, and then the, the, uh, the meeting started, or I can, running parallel to, I think, in, and after uh, Father Bede's talks, uh, about the future of the community. And out of that came a... Um, basic structure of the WCCM, of the Guiding Board, and so on, International Centre in London, as you heard. Basically what we have now, which, is, which needs to be renewed and uh, restructured 40, 30 years later. So we're in that process now, and this, this is a, another turning point, I think, in, the, in the, w, the life of the WCCM. We were going to come here and 2021 for the 30th anniversary, but we couldn't because of COVID. And uh, I think it's, it was a significant 
um, delay because now we are really conscious of, of the spirit moving in us, not knowing where we're going eh, totally, but knowing at the same time we're not where we were 30 years ago. What was born 30 years ago uh, has grown and is growing now into a, a, some, something, a new phase, a new, a new expression. So, so it was a sense of uh, something overflowing, a sense of a kairos moment, you know, there's chronos, which is, you know, measuring years and anniversaries, but there was also the chronos sense of, a spe sorry, the kairos sense of a, of a moment in time, which was also an intersection with the, with, a, with the divine plan, if you want to call it, with the way things were unfolding uh, on a scale that, of course, we couldn't imagine, but part of something that the Spirit of God is continually guiding and teaching us. So it was a, it was a very beautiful, joyful, faith-filled time as I... As I I think this coming seminar will be for us and for, uh, for Jason Gordon to be here is significant too for ways I'll explain later. And um, I think we're, we're not repeating the past, but in some, in some ways, I don't know if you've had this experience in your own lives, but things do repeat themselves. And... Uh, but it, always in a different way, and the difference is just as important as what is being repeated. So um, that is a rather complicated answer to a simple question. Thank you. So we're going to open the room for our people joining us. This shows how far we've come since 1991. <laughs> we now become instantly global and instantaneous. Well, there I am, Margaret, Margaret, David, 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 Chris Bleach. Wow. Wow. How many countries are represent are, are here? Do you know? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Yet. <laughs> okay. Well, I'd like to welcome you all, who are joining us, flashing up on the screen. All of us here in the conference room at New Harmony. Uh, uh, we just watched a little video on the uh, 1991 seminar, uh, as we are now going to begin the. 2024 seminar with a short introduction and a time of meditation. So welcome to you all for joining us and um, I hope you will find these coming days um, as inspirational and as uh, significant as, as, we, as, we, as we did in 1991 and as I feel we are being led at the moment. So thank you all for joining us and we will, you will be participating in this uh, in this experience here, and I hope we'll be enriched by it. So let's begin at the beginning. When you begin to meditate, you don't really know where you are going to be led. I was first introduced to meditation at university by John Main, and I was my first year at university. I was struck deeply. Ah, oh, before I go any further, we must welcome one of the fathers of the community, Clem Survey. Welcome, Clem. <laughs> welcome, Clem. We'll introduce you more later. Thank you. So um, I was when he 
introduced me to meditation, I wasn't prepared for what he was going to say. He said it very simply and, sh and quickly, and I didn't understand what he said, but at the same time, my heart was deeply moved by, by it. And I knew that this was something I needed and wanted to pursue, but I, I didn't start in a very disciplined way um, until I began my monastic journey some years later. And I would say that after 45 years, I'm still a beginner. And I think any of you who've been meditating for more than a short, short time regularly will understand what that means. And that is not an expression of failure. What's the matter? That's not an expression of failure. You know, I'm still a beginner. Every meditator is returning to their beginning. Or we could say they are returning to their ever-present origin. The origin is not really a beginning. We are returning to our source, the ever-present source. And this returning to our beginning, to our source, the ever-present origin, is a triumph over the tyranny of time. But it takes time. Only through time is time conquered. Why should we begin to meditate at all? One very good reason, and one that probably drives most people, I think, is curiosity. Sancta curiositas, holy curiosity. I think it was Einstein coined the phrase, holy curiosity, as he was describing the freedom of inquiry that was necessary for pure science. Curiosity. Curiosity, for example, about the meaning of Psalm 46, which says, Be still and know that I am God. Why? Why should stillness lead us to the knowledge of God's being? and the knowledge of God opening up the fact that we can only know God because we are known by God. If that doesn't make you curious, then you probably won't meditate as a, in, a very, for, in a very deep motivation. You may just meditate to relax, to deal with stress, but whatever your motivation for beginning, if you practice it, then I think seriously and humbly, faithfully, then I think it will lead to this depth of curiosity. What does it mean, what does it mean to that the mystery is Christ in you? the hope, your hope of a glory to come. If that doesn't make you curious about the meaning of your life, of your existence, of the passing of time and of the, and, the, and the discovery of depth and meaning, then you probably won't want to meditate. In Proverbs it says, it is the glory of God to conceal things. But the glory of human beings is to discover them. So in meditation, we are really discovering what it may appear God is concealing. In any case, it's a milestone, it's a milestone for us when we begin to meditate. 
And usually we can look back, just as we look back now to 1991, we can look back to when we first began this interior pilgrimage. And to begin is wonderful because you have nothing to lose, because you haven't got anything, because it is something quite new, ever present origin. And so as a beginner, you have nothing to lose except your distraction and your fear. The inner force that draws us onto this journey is faith. Meditation is the practice of faith. That's why it asks us to be faithful to it, faithful to the mantra, faithful to the daily practice. No one can force anyone to meditate. You can't even force people by guilt. <laughs> it's something that we have to discover and do discover for ourselves in the most personal way. And wherever we start from in terms of belief, and this, this is of great importance for anyone concerned about the church today, wherever you may be on your journey of belief, meditation is a direct way into the experience of faith. And be careful as you begin this journey because you will find God. If you are already religious, it will change your image, your imagination about God, and it will challenge and transform your beliefs about God. And if you are not religious, it will lead you into an experience of God as it, as it did Etty Hillesum, for example, uh, that you have no words for yet. John Main used to often use the expression in your own experience. But he said that from deep, a deep insertion in a tradition in a mystical tradition and in an ecclesial tradition. Recognizing that however wonderful that tradition, it must come alive in your own experience if it is to be alive. So for many people today, perhaps most people today, we come to meditation after we have got used to living inside a lie, inside a false set of values and conditionings. And in our public life, we are surrounded by falsehoods, deceptions, manipulation. And in the media, we don't know what is the difference between truth and reality. We become addicted to the lies conspiracies, and confusions. So all of us, to some degree, come to meditation after living inside a lie. And living inside a lie is like being sedated. You don't really feel awake. You think you're living a life a kind of virtual reality or a hallucination. And meditation is like waking up out of the dream, out of the falsehoods, out of the falsehoods of sin understood in, a, in this way. And it is very direct and simple because meditation is about being, not doing. We are endlessly doing. We fill up all our available moments 
often rather without, much without purpose, as long as we are busy, even when we're on holiday, we have to be running. And here we now we encounter a wisdom in meditation that just exposes the falsehood of that illusion and it teaches us just be, at least for this time of meditation. Begin to be. But then we discover that this being is pure action. It changes things, it changes us, and it changes the world. Meditation follows the wisdom of all the great traditions as a middle way, a way between extremes, a razor's edge, as the Upanishads calls it, or the narrow path, as Jesus calls it, that leads to life. It takes us into the inner room. It takes us into silence, where we stop babbling. It takes us into stillness, as we let go of our worries and anxieties, equanimity. It takes us into simplicity, as we learn to be single-focused, set your mind on God's kingdom, and everything else will come to you. And it takes us into the present moment, transforming our experience of time. Do not worry about tomorrow. So then we begin to realize that this very simple practice has a very deep meaning. And it is something that we come to embrace and to love as we love any art that we practice with discipline. And the essential discipline of meditation in the tradition that we teach is the mantra, the sacred word. And in order to leave aside our monkey minds, our busy, busy, overactive, stream of consciousness in order to leave that aside so that we can move into the inner room of the heart the temple of the heart we take a single word as taught by the early monks and passed on by john main we take a single word or a short phrase and repeat it in the mind and heart continuously We stay with the same word. It's helpful if it's not in our own language because it doesn't stimulate our thought and imagination. It's helpful if the sound of the word is calming. And it's helpful uh, if it is a sacred word. So the word that John Main recommended, and we continue to recommend, is the word Maranatha but it's not a brand name. I mean, it's, a, it's a, you could choose another word, but this word, which is the oldest Christian prayer in the, after the Lord's Prayer, means come Lord and is in the language that Jesus spoke. And for many reasons, the sound, the length, the meaning, the provenance of the word, it is an ideal mantra. And if you choose this, say it as four syllables of equal length, ma, ra, na, tha. I would suggest you don't visualize it, because we've got enough images in our mind. So don't visualize it, but sound the word as you articulate it clearly in your mind at first and then in your heart, and listen to the word as you say it. Mantra can be described in many ways, and you'll find your own ways of, through your own experience of understanding what a gift it is. 
It's a path through the jungle of your thoughts and feelings and of your memories. It's a harmonic bringing order into the discordance of your being and of your mind. It's like a plow that churns up the soil so that it is receptive to the word of God in your life. And it is a signal that you can trust to keep you on course to your destination. So the essence of meditation, if we approach it like this, is that it is of great meaning and, and great importance to us and to our times, but it is also very simple as befits anything that is going to be continually taking you back to, the, or, to your origin. It's also a very em embodied way of prayer, the prayer of the heart, contemplative prayer, however we may wish to describe it. It's not headspace, it is heart space. It is the prayer of the heart. And therefore it integrates every dimension of our being, physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual, or let's say it, it, it integrates them all in the spirit. But the embodiment that we experience in meditation, and why one of the first things you may find is that it is, makes you feel more at home in your own body, and more at home with yourself, is that it shows us that this is a, a, a incarnational way of prayer and that through this journey of faith that we are making and we don't know where it's going to take us that through this journey of faith we will discover the risen Christ so your physical posture is important so maybe we could just uh, Pay attention to that for a moment and sit upright with your back straight. Relax your shoulders, relax the muscles of your face where we carry stress. Feet on the ground, your hands on your lap or on your knees so that your body feels relaxed uh, but alert and also harmonious. And you can close your eyes lightly and silently in your mind, in your heart. Then be begin to say your word. Ma ra na tha. Ma ra na tha. As you say the word, listen to it with your full attention. And when you get distracted, don't feel any kind of failure. And don't try to succeed, but just faithfully return to the mantra. Faith replaces success and failure as ways of evaluating yourself. So keep returning to the word gently humbly, like a child, immediately that you realize that you have become distracted. Ma, ra, na, tha. We can begin now, and we'll meditate for about 20 minutes. I think, yes, or so. And we'll, we can begin with this uh, opening prayer that many of meditators and groups uh, around the world in our community use, uh, one that was composed by John Main in his first teaching on meditation. If you know the prayer, then 
Let's say it together. Heavenly Father, open our hearts to the time and presence of the Spirit of your Son. Lead us into that mysterious silence where your love is revealed to all who call. Mara Natha, come, Lord Jesus. Good. Let's conclude with these words of St. Paul to the Romans. As we begin these days of openness to the Spirit and openness to the transformation that the Spirit brings. My friends, I implore you by God's mercy to offer your very selves to him. The worship offered by mind and heart. Adapt yourselves no longer to the pattern of this present world, but let your minds be remade and your whole nature thus transformed then you will be able to discern the will of God and to know what is good, acceptable, and perfect. Thank you. And my very deep gratitude to, uh, to Matt, um, and through him to the whole of the U.S. community for hosting this year's seminar. Thank you. <laughs>